Just would like to introduce, uh, obviously, when my, on my left, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed al Dubayan, and after him, uh, Sheikh uh, Tajul Islam, who is the Khatib of this masjid, Stepin Jahajal al Masjid. He also joined us. May Allah bless him. Um, before we proceed uh, and we come to uh, our Dr. Ahmed al Dubayan, I'd like to request our brother Masoom from Labbaik to just perform uh, an ashid for the entertainment of our young brothers. So please come forward and perform your beautiful ashid. Brother Nasum, Masum, obviously, he's a very well-known figure in the world of nasheed and he is actually a celebrity. Uh, you know, he's, he's well-known to many people uh, internationally, and he performs in international uh, events. So may Allah bless him, please receive. Good respected ulama, elders, brothers and sisters, I greet you, greet you with the greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This machine that I'm going to sing to you is from our fourth album, Gratitude. Uh, before I sing this machine, I want to ask you a quick question. How many of you guys have been to Hajj? Raise your hands. MashaAllah. The paramount for this, MashaAllah, have been to Hajj. For those, of us that, for those of us that have not been, may Allah SWT invite us uh, to the blessed city of Hajj. Uh, so this message that I'm going to sing to you uh, is about Hajj, uh, as it is fitting to the topic of today, inshallah, which will be discussed while Haramain. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The greatest season of our assembly To journey and purify their souls All the people from all nations Gather in one place from around the world Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik Inna alhamda wa ni'amata there's no distinction, a king a poor man Before the Lord now stands side by side Two pieces of cloth are seen as honor For today on we be dressed in white Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik Inna alhamda wa ni'amata Laka wal mulk la sharika lak The camps of Mina, the plains of Arafah We that disturbed as meaning sublime Muzdalifah, the lava fill more home With the sky as the roof for tonight Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik Inna alhamda wa ni'amata Laka wal mulk la sharika lak All follow closely Hajar Ibrahim It's a tale that took place long ago Had they both then known Allah loved it so To see this journey relived and be told Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik Inna alhamda wa ni'amata Laka wal mulk la sharika lak the place where Adam and Eve descended The first spot chosen on of mankind All hearts connected, each one reflecting We have the same roots, same cause, you and I Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik Inna alhamda wa ni'amata Laka wal mulk la sharika lak Make supplications, take with you patience Mostly you keep love within you alive Power for Kaaba, the whole experience You need to go back again in your life 
Thank you very much, Brother Masoom from Labaik, uh, for this beautiful Nasheed, uh, worldly renowned, internationally renowned Nasheed artist, Brother Masoom. Jazakumullah khairan. Without any further ado, I would like to give one more time a warm welcome to all the brothers uh, to this monthly auspicious gathering organized by Al Falak Dawa Project and uh, in affiliation with Sabi Shah Jalal Masjid and also Haji Nasiha this time. Um, uh, before I um, proceed, I would like to just give a small, a brief introduction uh, of Dr. Ahmed Al Dubayan. Uh, he was born in Saudi Arabia and he completed his BA degree from the Faculty of Language, uh, Imam Mohammed bin Saud University in Riyadh. He uh, actually also worked as a lecturer in the same university, uh, Imam Mohammed bin Saud University in Riyadh. Also, he worked as a lecturer in uh, the university in Jakarta in Indonesia. Um, he was also the head of Islamic uh, department in the Saudi Embassy in, uh, in Germany. Uh, and uh, Mashallah has been working very actively in London for the last 20 years uh, as a director of London Central Mosque and Islamic Culture Center in Regent's Park. He contributed immensely towards uh, the betterment and well-being of the Muslim communities in the United <laughs> Kingdom on all levels. We're actually very happy to have him here. He doesn't travel that much, I know, to different parts of London. He likes staying within the central mosque. But <laughs> Alhamdulillah, we're very happy to have him here. It's definitely Shah Jalal Masjid. So we're very uh, uh, happy and would like to say Jazakumullah Khairan from Shah Jalal Masjid and from the Tahamless Council, as well as the Bara, or, and, and also East London. Uh, Jazakumullah Khairan. So I'd like to pass the microphone to Dr. Ahmed Dubayan. Bismillah <coughs> rahman rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. أحمده سبحانه وحمد الشاكرين وأستغفره واستغفار المذنبين والصلاة والسلام الزاكيان على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وإمام المتقين وسيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أخواني السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Now first of all I have to correct شيء قاضي لتبت في علومي Actually, I, I didn't come here because I didn't find time, but it doesn't mean that I hate to come here. <laughs> no, I love to see you. I love to come to all of you. Wallahi al-Azim, but Allah knows that is really how much the time is so tight because of many responsibilities, many engagements, and everything in the London Central Mosque. Maybe some of you know about that. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I would like to thank Sheikh Qadi, my, my brother and my colleague also in the London Central Mosque, and all of you and the Sheikh Saqari and the Sheikh the Imam also for my for this invitation. I'm really so happy to be among you here today. And forgive me because this is the first time I come. But inshallah maybe there will be other times. Inshallah. If you like it of course, I don't know. <laughs> inshallah. Uh, our subject today I think is very important and the Sheikh uh, recite actually Surah Al Qadr and recite some verses about the Ramadan. We are only a few days about in, in Ramadan. And Sheikh told me to speak about uh, how we receive Shah Ramadan and also to, to, to speak about khasais or virtues of Mecca and Medina. Yes. I don't know which one you want to start with. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's start maybe with, with, uh, with uh, uh, Ramadan. Uh, as, you might, or as, you, as you want, or khasais Mecca and Medina. Well, actually, let's start with Mecca. <coughs> I need the Hajj. <laughs> uh, also, the, uh, the, the, the nasheed was about Labbaik and about Hajj. Let's start about Mecca and Hajj, inshallah. Mm. Uh, of course, as we know, Hajj is, the, is the, the fifth pillar of Islam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran, Hajj in the beginning of Islam was not a duty. Till after, of course, the, the Hijrah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed at the end of, around the end of the life of the Prophet, وسلم, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, ask or order his prophet and the mu'mineen to go to Mecca for Hajj. The, the thing that is actually this pillar of Islam is different from other five, four pillars. The other four pillars you can do them anywhere except the fifth one that is you have to do it in a special precisely in a certain place that is Mecca. Shahada you can see it and believe in it anywhere. Prayer you can do it anywhere any mosque and sometimes some of the prayers it's better to be done 
and at home also, not in the mosque. Which one? Someone. Salatul Layl. Salatul Layl is better at home actually. And Sunan also sometimes uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, don't, don't, don't have your house like cemeteries. Nobody is praying there. You have to pray sometimes at home. <coughs> and the zakat, you can do, do it also anytime when you have a saving, a saved money and the money after one year you have to give the zakat. It's not only in Ramadan, it is any time when the year actually passed, then you have to give the zakat. I'm going to talk about this inshallah. And also Siyam, which is the fourth. Siyam is Ramadan. This is you can fast anywhere, but the time is a certain time, which is the month of Ramadan. While the Hajj is actually certain about the time and certain about the place where the Hajj, this, this, this pillar must be done in this place, in this time. This is actually in the month of the Hijjah, the last month of the Islamic calendar. The Hijjah started from the eighth day till, of course, the 13th of the Hijjah. It's about five days, the whole Hajj. You can make it even shorter, but it's better really to do it all full, especially for those who go for Hajj for the first time. Mecca itself as a city actually has some virtues because it's a holy place. Why Mecca is the holy place? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen this place for his house, for the Kaaba, which we call it the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this, some scholars said Ibrahim, Ibrahim is the one who built the, the, the Kaaba for the first time with his son Ismail, as it is mentioned in the Quran. The Quran didn't say actually it, it is the first time to be built, but he said when Ibrahim and his son Ismail left the foundation of the Kaaba and they put it, which means maybe it was built before. And some scholars said the Kaaba was built even before Ibrahim, but it was destroyed maybe after a long time and forgotten. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, peace be upon him, and with his son Ismail, peace be upon him, to, to come there and to raise the building again after the destruction to, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to renew the rituals again for people to come for Hajj. All Arabs in the Arab Peninsula, even before the days of the Prophet wasallam, they know this place is a holy place. And some of them used to say, well, this is the, our father Ibrahim, is the one who built the Kaaba. And of course, they don't know all the rituals of the Hajj, but they know going around the Tawaf, they know it, they used to do it. And sometimes they used to go for maybe for Mina, but they don't know all the rituals before the Prophet wasallam, because this kind of worship has been forgotten in that time from the days of Ibrahim till the days of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's actually a long time. When did Ibrahim live? Anybody knows when Ibrahim lived? Which year, which time, which century? He was about 2000 before BC, before Jesus Christ. So we have about 2000 before the Messiah, before Jesus Christ. This is the time when Ibrahim Salam lived. And then we have 500 years after Jesus, so between Ibrahim and, he, and, uh, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhammad, we have 2,500 years. Of course, a lot of things are already forgotten. A lot of things forgotten, but they know in general this place is a holy place. And, this, and even before Islam, the Arabs sometimes, if someone killed anybody and they run and to go to Mecca, they don't touch him in Mecca. They wait till the person goes out, then they catch him. Because they know this is a, a forbidden or prohibited area. Uh, this is a haram area. That means don't do something, don't kill, don't shed any blood in it. That was before the Prophet ﷺ, when Prophet ﷺ came, Nabina Muhammad wasalam, that was confirmed of course in the Quran, and all these rituals then again renewed by the Quran and added, and of course all the old rituals which had been forgotten in that time, they are again ordered by the Quran again. One of the virtues for this place, this is the Haram area. This is an area in Mecca which Ibrahim السلام, himself, he decided this according to, of course, teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This area is haram. When we say this area is haram, or Mecca al-Balad al-Haram, or al-Masjid al-Haram, what does it mean? Some people, especially those who do not know about Islam or sometimes the new Muslims, they know haram, it means prohibited, like halal meat, haram meat. When you say Masjid haram, they say, how come Masjid haram? Doesn't match. That means we, we are not allowed to pray, for example. No, that means this area is haram, it is, it is very respected. There are rules for it. One of the rules for Bayt al-Haram and for Masjid al-Haram, for Mecca al-Mukarramah, that is you, you must not kill anything, even birds, even small animals, 
it is respected. So anybody, he, he is not allowed to hunt. No hunting in this area. When you move now from Jeddah to Mecca, you will see a sign in the middle of the way, which tells you from here, this line, the area, the Haram area starts. The Haram area is bigger than Mecca itself as a city. City is built inside this area. And some <coughs> quarters of Mecca, also even outside now, after the new buildings and new streets, the, the, the city itself spread even out of the, of the Haram area. The Haram area is, is wider. Okay, Mecca is there. When you enter this area, then rules are there always, all the time. One of the rules is no killing at all. So that's why also not carrying even weapons or something to kill anybody. But you are allowed, or someone is allowed to defend himself if he's attacked. But someone is, it's, it's haram to attack anyone. It's haram to kill any birds. It's haram to kill pigeons. It's haram to kill, for example, deers or whatever. This is, this, is, this is one of the rules. Secondly, it's haram also to cut any tree in that area. If you are in the tree there, it's not allowed to cut it. Unless, of course, there is a necessity for that. Yani, for example, the council, they want to build a street. Then they can then, uh, they can then remove the trees. You want to build your house. There is a tree in that place. You cannot build the house without cutting this tree. Then this is a necessity, you can do it. But cutting the tree, just like this, or cutting the trees for to give the, the food to animals is not allowed in Mecca at all. Maybe some people do not know about this. Third thing, one of the rules, this is all mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ in his hadith. <coughs> the third rule for, for, for this, the, for, for the haram, is, is not allowed to take anything lost and left in the street. Yani for example, you walk in Mecca and you find a wallet. Don't take it. It's haram to take anything left behind or lost by anybody because the person himself will come back again if we all respect the law then the wallet will stay in the street till the person the owner himself will come to take his, his thing but if someone picks it and then it will be lost really so it's not allowed to take anything left there if you find clothes bag wallet whatever in mecca leave it unless you you know the person you want to take it to give it back to him or you are going to look for him yeah, and for example, you find a bag or you find something valuable, then you take it and you give it to the police to say, please give it back to the owner. He may come, that this is like lost property. Then they are going to, to give it. But if you are sure these people are not going to give it, then it's not allowed to touch it. This is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. That means it's not, don't cut trees. Don't, don't, no, no, nobody is allowed to hunt. That means anything left, you, nobody can, can, can take it and, 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 and maybe give it to somebody else or maybe he think, okay, I can keep it for myself. It's not allowed. Well, actually, taking people's properties is not allowed anywhere, not only in Mecca. But in Mecca, is even more, more confirmed. These are some of the rules of Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to open Mecca, actually with their companions, in that time in the year 8 of the Hijrah, when he came, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed his prophet only one hour of the day to come with the army, with the weapons to come to Mecca to inside. After this hour, it, become, it became again prohibited like before. And the Prophet sallallahu himself said, it w I was allowed only one hour of the day just to come to Mecca with all the weapons we have. And then after this, it is prohibited again as the Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, announced this from the early days. These are the rules of Mecca. One of the virtues of Mecca also, that is praying in Masjid al-Haram, it is, it is equal to 100,000 salah. This is subhanAllah Azim, one of the virtues of Mecca. If you pray to Raqqa in Haram in Mecca, it is equal in Ajr and Thawab to 100,000. Can you imagine now if you pray there like the whole day or maybe you stay there many years? Every prayer is 100,000 prayers, equal to any, any prayer in the world else. I'm going to speak about Medina. This is the, these are these some of the rules. The Prophet ﷺ said, Salatun fi masjidi hadha, he, he, he meant the, the prophetic mosque, mosque in Medina, the Masjid al Nabi Medina, khayrun min ta'adilu alfa salah. Prayer in my mosque here in Medina is equal to 1,000 salah. Okay, and salatun fi masjid al haram ta'adilu mi'ata salat from here. Prayer in Masjid al-Haram is equal to 100 prayer in Medina. That means 100,000. And Salatun fil Masjid al-Aqsa, ta'adilu 500 salah. 
And prayer in Masjid Al-Aqsa, it's 500. Any prayer in any mosque on earth, it's not equal to these mosques. Even if we think sometimes this mosque is old or this mosque is, mashallah, built by somebody or maybe this, it, there is no virtue for this mosque, only for these three. Because there is a hadith, we have a delil from the Prophet ﷺ for this. We can, this is something we cannot, we cannot bring it from ourselves. This is something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one who told us either in the Quran or told us in, in, with his Prophet. Ibrahim السلام, when he came to this place also, the place was a valley, as it is mentioned in the Quran. I brought my family in this valley where there, there, is no, there are no trees, no water. It's a deserted place. And if you go to Mecca now, hardly you see a tree. And no wells in Mecca except Zamzam. <laughs> Subhanallah al -Azim. So it is, uh, we don't know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had chosen this place particularly to be the place for his, for his house. But there must, be, there must be a reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. When Abraham came to this place, Abraham himself saw the place is, is dry, deserted place. Nothing there. Then he make dua for this. رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلَ فِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ تَهُوِ إِلَيْهِمْ وَرْزُقْهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ then he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, Ya Allah, let attract the hearts of people to Mecca, to this place, and I'll make rizq for them from everywhere, for all the, 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 the thamarat, that means whatever actually the goods, if anything comes from up everywhere, you find it in Mecca. Now, if you go to Mecca, mashallah, you will find goods from everywhere in the world. You will find it there in shops. This is, this is the dua of Ibrahim. Now, everybody actually, every Muslim on this earth, Muslims now are maybe almost 1.5 billion. Everywhere, you will find every Muslim on earth, he is so keen to go one day to Mecca. This is That means people's heart will be attracted to this place. Even those maybe who are not that much practicing Islam and some other things, but when it comes to Mecca, when it comes to Hajj, when it comes to Umrah, you will find their hearts really so keen to go there. Their hearts are taken. And you hear the, the nasheed by the brother just a few minutes ago. And by the way, we have a very big literature about the love that people have for Mecca and for, for Haram, for Kaaba, for Zamzam, for Mina, for Muzdalifa, for Arafat, for all these places where the worship, where Ibrahim السلام, did the worship, did the Hajj worship for the first time with his son Ismail, then followed by other, other prophets, then at the end followed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is a big literature, not only in Arabic, there is a big literature in Arabic, there is a big literature in Urdu, there is a big literature in Bengali language, there is a big literature in Persian, there is a big literature in Turkish, in African languages, the poems, books, travelers' books, everything about going to Mecca. Even from, from the West, we have also memories from the West from many people went there. Some of them even in 18th, 17th, 19th century, they tried to go there even if they are not Muslims. And we, we have their books, what they wrote about Mecca, what they saw in Mecca, how they found the Muslim worship themselves. Because many Europeans in, in, in the Middle Ages, they, they have, of course, a lot, a lot of myths and wrong information about Mecca and Medina. Even some of them think the grave of the Prophet ﷺ is hanging in the air. It's not on the earth and it's not in the... And some, some, some European, they came, they said, what well, we would like to discover and find how Muslim did this. How did they put the grave there? Hanging in the room, not in the ceiling and not on the earth. That was, of course, not true. And then, but anyway, I'm telling you just some of the examples of the, the wrong information the European sometimes has from the Middle Ages, uh, especially after the Crusades. One of the virtues of Mecca, that is actually because it's prohibited area, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, they, some of them even left from Mecca. They said, we don't want to do any sin or mistake in the Balad al-Haram. Yes, one of them is Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu is the cousin of the Prophet وسلم. He is one of actually, the, he was 13 years old when the Prophet وسلم died. Ibn Abbas lived in Mecca sometime, then he moved to Taif, which is 40 kilometers from Mecca. When someone asked him, Are you, how come you go from Mecca and you stay in Taif? Taif, of course, the weather there is better than Mecca. It's not so hot, he get old also. Then he said, I cannot stay. Well, this is really a place. I'm, I feel shame that is to do anything wrong when I am in the Balad al-Haram, in the Haram area. And this is the, 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 the uh, it is also one of, one, of the, one of the places the scholars throughout history from everywhere, 
they tried to stay in Mecca for some time. We have many scholars who came and stay in Mecca after Hajj. Some of them stay till the next season. Some of, the, some of them stay many years. One of them, for example, is Jarullah Zamakhshari. He called himself uh, Jarullah. Why? Because that means Allah's neighbor. Or because he's in Mecca, that means he's a neighbor of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why they call, he called himself Jarullah. Uh, there, is, there is a special blessing in Mecca because of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. This is also one of the virtues of Mecca. There is a blessing. And that's why you see in Mecca, subhanallah, millions of people come every year. Millions. Now recently also the Umrah. Umrah is open most of the year. And also the, or the Hajj. You will find maybe at least 15 million come to Mecca every year. And with all these people who come, you will still find barakah, subhanAllah. And there is a blessing in this, in this city. Sometimes it's tight, it's crowd, even in Masjid al-Haram. Those who actually have patience, have patience and become patient in Mecca, actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them, will reward them for this because they come to worship and they suffer a little bit because of some, some problems, some circumstances actually in, 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 in Mecca. And that, we, that makes them really more rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are some of the virtues of Mecca and Mukarrama. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah give you all of you the chance to go there for Umrah and for Hajj. Not only one time, but more than one time inshallah. And of course recently we know now a lot of projects now done in Mecca. Also Mecca becomes bigger, a lot of street, a lot of channels. So because of the expanded, the expansion of the Haram, because of millions coming, you cannot keep the Haram as it was. Otherwise, it will not be it will not be possible actually to be to be to to, to uh, there will be like vacancy for for all people or the capacity of the mosque will not be enough for all people. We come to the the the, um, the Medina. Of course, one of the virtues of Mecca also Zamzam. Zamzam, and we we know the story of Zamzam. All of us, I don't think any Muslim actually doesn't know the story of Zamzam. But Zamzam is the blessed water. How do we know Zamzam is, Zamzam is blessed? Because the Prophet وسلم, said that. The Prophet said that about Zamzam. And it is really curing people when you have the intention for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give a blessing for, especially for this water. I have to mention here that is anything that is we think it's blessed, we have to have a delil from Shara. This is a very important point. Anything people tells you this is a blessed thing or a blessed place or a blessed mosque, or a blessed person, you have to have a delil from the shara. You have to have a proof from the, from the Quran or from the Sunnah. How do we know, for example, Zamzam is a blessed water? Because the Prophet said that. How do we know olive oil or oil or olive tree is a blessed? Because Allah mentioned this in the Quran. Any other water, if we don't have any proof from the Quran, from the Sunnah, then don't listen to what some people say. If you go to drink from that well, if you go to pray in particularly in this place, 30 minutes only. <laughs> I haven't talked about Medina, I haven't talked about Ramadan. <laughs> okay, count, count, yeah. Then any, anybody tells you that actually there is, or somebody is a blessing, is a blessed person. We, we may think, inshallah, this person is blessed, but we are not 100% sure. So what people, some people sometimes do, when someone comes, they touch him because they get blessing. There is no evidence for this person is blessed. Maybe the person who is touching the, per the, the other one is blessed more than this person who has been touched. This is something you need. You have to be very careful about that. Now we come to Medina. Medina, of course, it was called Yathrib before, before the, the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet moved to Medina, that was, of course, instructions or that's all order from demand from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he went to Medina, he went with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq together and they actually hidden themselves in a cave for three days. After that, they moved, they continued their way to Medina. When they came to Medina, Islam was there already. How Islam came to the Medina before the Prophet ﷺ? Because the Prophet ﷺ sent some of the companions, sent Mus'ab bin Umair to Medina to educate people to teach them the religion. So when the Prophet ﷺ came, arrived Medina, there were many Muslims. Not all people in Medina were Muslims, but many, many people, many houses, many husbands, many wives, many children, they actually, they were Muslim before the Prophet ﷺ came. When the Prophet ﷺ came, Medina, first of all, of course, he changed the name of the Medina. Instead of Yathrib, he called it Medina. And it is mentioned in the Quran. 
It is with, with the new name Al, Al Madinah. So from that day, it is called Al Madinah. Madinah in Arabic means city. Now any city we call it Medina. If you like to say Medina to London, that means city of London. This is in Arabic. But when we say Al Medina, the Medina, that is actually it goes only to the Medina where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He called it Al Medina. Prophet sallallahu stayed in Medina only ten years. Can you imagine all these things that we see in the biography of the Prophet sallallahu All these battles and all these things, all the tashri' and the teachings and the Quran and all. The, all these incidents and events and activities happening in the seerah within 10 years in the Medina, subhanallah al -Azim. You see how much the, the time of the Prophet ﷺ was blessed. He, he, he did a lot of things actually in short time. And in Mecca, after the first revelation, he stayed only 13 years. When he received the first revelation, he was 40 years old, sallallahu alayhi wa Then he stayed in Mecca 13 years. Young people, must, you must memorize this. The, old, the age of the Prophet ﷺ when he re received the first revelation was 40. So he lived in Mecca as a person, normal person, till he is 40 years old ﷺ. But people in Mecca during the 40 years, actually they know, they call him the honest, the Amin, Al Amin, the honest person. Because when they, they dealt with him, selling, buying, dealing with anything, he's a very honest person, never lie, never cheated, never tricked people at all. When he was in the age of 40, he received the first revelation of the Quran. Then he stayed 13 years in Mecca, trying to establish the Muslim community, the first Muslim community or society in Mecca. It didn't work because there was war from the people, the disbelievers in Mecca, who tortured the companions, who tried to kill some of them. They killed some of them, actually. Then the Prophet ﷺ, after that time, sent some of the companions to Al Habasha, to Abyssinia in Africa. Then he himself decided to go to Medina. After he met some people from Medina in Mecca, they said, okay, we welcome you if you come. Then he sent Mus'ab bin Umayr to teach people in Medina. After a short time, he himself, sallallahu alayhi wa went with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq to Al-Medina. And this is what we call the Hijrah. And this is the first year in Islamic calendar. That's year one from the Hijrah. And that's why we write itch after the year now uh, in, the, in the Islamic calendar. The Medina has virtues also. One of the first virtues is the Prophet ﷺ is buried there. The grave of the Prophet ﷺ is in Medina. And this is of course the biggest honor of this city. This is the biggest honor of this city. And the, the Prophet ﷺ said, The Prophets are buried in the place when, where, where they die, where they pass away. So when he actually died, he died in the room of, A of Aisha radiallahu anha. Then Abu Bakr told them, they said, I hear the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said that. Then they dig in the same place where he, where sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. This is his, his actually the place where his grave is till today. And of course, in the beginning that was beside the mosque. It's not inside the mosque. I'm going to tell you about this if the time allows us. One of the virtues of the, of the Medina, there is a blessing in Medina. And subhanAllah, I mean, because of the dua of the Prophet sallallahu Muhammad. Mecca, the blessing came from the dua of Ibrahim. The blessing of Medina came from the dua of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And he, he, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give blessing in food, to give blessing in people, also to remove the diseases from Medina outside. And that's why the scholars said the Medina, there is no illness or epidemic illness can come and spread in Medina. Subhanallah al This is because of the barakah of the dua of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you can feel it yourself, subhanAllah. When those who visited Medina, when you come to the Medina, you feel your heart changed. You don't know why, but you feel there is something happened. This is, I felt it, and everybody who went to Medina, they know that. When they come to Medina, they find really things very easy. There is a blessing everywhere you go. Even the people are so kind and so nice. If you talk to somebody in the street, there is a special spirituality in this city. This is because of the dua of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is because he is there. And Medina also, it is one of, it is the best city well to live, if you can. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Al-Iman fil Medina, inna al-Iman la ya'rizu ila al-Madina kama ta'rizu al-Hayyatu ila juhriya. Iman comes back to Medina, always goes out and comes back to Medina, and the Prophet gave a model, example, he said, like a snake, goes out from it, its home and comes back again. It doesn't go away. Inna al-Imana la ya'rizu ila al-Madina. means comes back to Madina kama ta'rizu al-Hayyatu ila juhriya. As the snake comes back to its home. 
sneaking, then coming back to them. The Medina is the house of the Iman, because the Prophet is there. One of the blessed area in Medina is Al-Baqir, where the many companions of the Prophet and the Sahaba, they are buried there. And Nabi Sallallahu made a dua for Ahl Medina, Allahumma ghafir li Ahl Al-Baqir. He asked Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to forgive for all people who are buried in Baqir. Subhanallah Al-Azim. And many, by the way, after the, the generation of the Sahaba, many followers, Tabi'een, buried there. Many scholars buried there. Till today, some people are buried in Al-Baqir. This is a special place which is not far away from, from, from the Haram. Uh, <clears throat> al Medina also the Prophet وسلم, said, I will be the Shafi' in the Day of Judgment for anybody who stay in Medina and he has some suffering like from poverty or illness or whatever in Medina and then he take this with patience and tawakkul ala Allah. He will get my Shafa'a in the Day of Judgment. Allah. This is also a speciality about the Medina. And of course I have mentioned to you that is if you pray in Medina then uh, it, it's equal to 1,000 Salah if you pray some, somewhere else. Uh, and Medina, there is a prohibited area in Medina. It's the same. It's not, not the rules like Mecca. In some rules, yes, it is like Mecca, but not every, in everything. The Prophet وسلم, also decided an area in Medina which is a prohibited area as Ibrahim did for Mecca. So the Pro Ibrahim decided the prohibited area the Pro in Mecca. Nabi وسلم, decided the prohibited area in, in Medina. And Ibrahim did, did, made dua for Mecca for blessing, and uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi made for Medina for blessing. So you see, it is it, the, actually the, the two holy cities for all Muslims on this earth. And uh, there is a lot of literature written about Mecca and Medina, about history, about travelers, about graves, about old mosques, about, about memoir of, of journeys, many. It's a big library, you can read it in any of Islamic languages. I think maybe this is a summary about. We come now to Ramadan, which is actually only a few days ago. How, many, how much time we have? 25 minutes. 25 minutes, that's it. Ramadan now is, uh, of course, as I mentioned, is the fourth pillar of Islam. As Siyam, in Ramadan, we, in, in Arabic, we call it Siyam or Saum. It's the same meaning. Saum or Siyam. Sometimes you find Saum, sometimes you find Siyam. It is the same, two words for the same meaning in Arabic. <coughs> two synonyms, as they say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala farad al-Siyam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered even previous religions to do the Siyam. In Christianity there is Siyam. In Judaism there is Siyam. Even maybe old religions there is Siyam. But the Siyam sometimes is like prayer. They also had prayers. But their prayers may be different from ours, and our siyam is different from theirs. Because they, they, you, have to, you have to always remember this. The core of each religion is the tawheed. This is the tawheed. It is the thing that is you will never find it different from any prophet to another or from any religion to another. The tawheed from Adam till Nuh alayhi salam, alayhi salam to Ibrahim al-Khalil, Idris, Ishaq, Ya'qub, Ismail, uh, Musa, Isa, ila Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Tawheed is the same. It's only La ilaha illallah. And worship is only for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He's the only one who deserves to be worshipped. Any kind of worship should not be given to anybody. What is worship here? Worship is prayer. Worship is dua. Worship is siyam. If somebody does siyam for somebody else, this is shirk. If somebody does dua for somebody else, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is again shirk. You have to have in your heart, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only God. He is the only Allah. He is the creator. He is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. So when I make dua, it is to him. When I make prayer, it is only for him. When I make fasting, siyam, it's only for him. When I go for hajj, it's only for him. When I ask help, it's only from him. Especially in the things that is not only Allah can do. Yeah, and you cannot go to somebody and you say, well, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have children. Can you help me to have children? Except he's a doctor, he will give you a medicine. Mm -hmm. But of course, beyond then this, man, he cannot do anything. He cannot. Somebody, for example, is blind, totally blind. Then nobody can help him to get his sight back. Somebody is ill. Okay, or paralyzed, for example, and all the doctors cannot do it. Who can do it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to keep always this in your mind. That is, Allah is almighty. He's the only one who can give help. He's the only one who can rescue. He's the only one who can forgive sins. Nobody can forgive sins except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So when you ask for forgiveness, you go to him. Even now, if you go to Mecca or to Medina, the Prophet Sallallahu is the one who delivered this to us all. But when we come to pray, when Salat Iqamatu Salat start, we turn our faces to Mecca. We don't turn our faces to the grave of the Prophet Because now it's time for worship. Worship is not for the Prophet, it's for Allah. With all the love we have for the Prophet, with all the respect we have for the Prophet Sallallahu but worship is something different. Worship is only for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this is the pure Tawheed. This is the thing you have to keep it always in your mind. This is the core of all religions. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran mentioned said, with all the prophets I sent, they deliver this message. La ilaha illallah. This is every Muslim must, when he pass away, he must go away with this belief. Regardless the sin you have done, but this one must be there with you. This is the sin here. If someone lose this meaning, he is out of the circle of Islam completely. If someone, for example, does a mistake like drinking alcohol or maybe doing something, this is a sin, but he's still a Muslim. He can make a istighfar, he can ask forgiveness, repent, doesn't come back again, then Allah forgive this. But even when you don't have the Tawheed, you have to enter the Islam from the beginning. This is a very, very, it's the most important thing in the whole religion. Now, Ramadan is coming, the fourth pillar of Islam. Siyam in Islam is a little bit different from Siyam with other religions because Siyam in Islam it is you have to sustain, prevent yourself from food, drinks, relation with wives and husbands from dawn, uh, fajr till actually ghurub al-shams, till the, 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 the sunset. Is this only Siyam? That's all? I do this and halas finish? No, it's not only that. We have to understand what Ramadan means. Ramadan means actually it's a changing point in everybody's life. When Ramadan comes to you, you have to prepare yourself. This is a turn point. This is a place where I want to change. It's a good chance for you, for every Muslim really to be, to start again. You have to start a new life. How I start a new life? In, in different levels. You have to start, for example, with your worship. You have to revise yourself. I'm going to do the fasting. Is the fasting what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want me to do is just only I don't eat and I don't, I don't drink? No, it's more than this. Fasting also manners. You have to behave yourself. You have to be honest. You have to be, you have to be a person who is fair and just with other people. You have to be a person who takes care of his, his parents, your moms and your dads, your wives, your husbands, your neighbors, everybody. It's actually a turning point for everybody socially. That means you have to correct all the relations around you in Ramadan. Maybe you have forgotten one of your cousins. Maybe you have done some mistakes to your mom. Maybe you are not the good boy for your father. Maybe you had a problem with your neighbor. Maybe you have a problem with a friend. Try to go there and try to remedy all this and settle it in Ramadan. This is socially. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be one of the good people, not only for yourself, but for yourself for your family, for your society. That's one. Ramadan is the month of generosity. It's not the month of, of actually greedy habits or greedy people. The Prophet ﷺ is always generous, but he is more generous when Ramadan comes. He's more generous when Ramadan comes. That's why you see some people, they give iftar, they give charities, they help people. A Muslim is supposed to be generous all the time, not only in Ramadan. You cannot be generous in Ramadan and greedy after Ramadan. You have to be generous all the time, but you have to be more, especially in Ramadan, because it is the month of blessing, the month of barakah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you more during this month. You have to take care of those around you and maybe you forget them. Maybe your neighbors, there are orphans. Maybe around you there are some widows. Around you, maybe there are some poor people. You forget them all the time because you are busy. You are busy with your work, you are busy with your traveling, you are busy with your job, you are busy with your family. Go back. Think about who is around you. When Ramadan comes, this is a turning point. This is a place where we try to fix all the problems that is we had all the year before. Starting from our social life. That's, that's one. Number two, you have to correct yourself. 
those people actually who do some some mistakes or some sins repeatedly, they must really try to give up in Ramadan. It's the time, and Siyam will help you a lot because he, Siyam is helping you to control yourself, control yourself from food. Now, if you go in the morning during Ramadan, 10 o'clock, and you walk, for example, in the street, Starbucks is not far away from there, you smell the coffee. <laughs> 10 o'clock in the morning, it's wonderful to smell the coffee. But who stop you not going there and order coffee and drink it? Nobody cares if you do this. Maybe nobody sees you also. The one who sees you is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you remember this and you prevent yourself and you hold yourself from this, this is what we call it obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the ibadah. This is to show your obedience to Allah, to show to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you are controlled by instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can hide yourself and eat. Who knows? Nobody knows. You can go to the toilet as if you do wudu and then you drink water. Nobody knows. You are fasting, but Allah knows everything. Allah knows even what you think about in your heart. <laughs> Subhanallah al -Azim. So remember this always. So Ramadan is the time to control yourself, to be better than before. Those brothers who sometimes drink things which are not allowed, those brothers even who sometimes smoke, it is their chance really to give up, to quit from all this. Quit. But when you want to do the quit, quitting, you have to remember you are doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have the real intention for this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you. He will help you to do it. <coughs> intention, I'm going to talk about it. <coughs> also, Ramadan is a good chance for you to what we call it now in the, in the modern time, we call it time management. To manage your time. Ramadan will help you to do this. Ramadan will help you to manage your time. You have to wake up for the Sahur, Salatul Fajr. Maybe you have some activity after Salatul Fajr. It's better to be reading the Quran because the Quran and Fajr and the Quran and Fajr are mashhuda. Then after that, you will sleep for a while. Then you go to your job or you go to your school for young people. And then after afternoon, uh, of course, they will come back. Then they will be with their families. They will sleep maybe a little bit again. Then after Asr, you will go. To, to, to do some activity, to read the Quran, for example, doing some activities, helping your family. Maghrib comes, iftar, then Salatul Taraweeh. In the last 10 days, Salatul Tahajjud. So it is really a system. If you follow it precisely, it will give you what we call it the time management in this day. Ramadan is the month of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran for the first time during this month. And also scholars say Allah revealed the whole Quran to Sama al dunya to the lower Sama heaving, and then from there down little by little, verse by verse, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why even the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the scholars in the early generations of Islam, when Ramadan comes, they give up with everything, any kind of reading except the Quran. Even those who study the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu when Ramadan comes, they put the hadith aside, and they start only to spend all the time for the Quran. Allah. Why? Because they know it is a blessed, blessed month and it is the month of the Quran and read the Quran. I remember when I was young, some people spend most of the day actually in the, in, the, in the mosque reading the Quran. Some of them read the Quran five times in the month, six times, ten times even. There are every three days they make khatma, they finish. Of course, not everybody is, a, is, 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 a, is able to do this. Some people are busy, some people are busy with things that they cannot avoid. And work, if you have the intention, is a kind of worship also. Even if you go to work for your family with the intention for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will reward you even for work. Because Allah doesn't want you to destroy your family and stay all the time in the mosque. You don't take care of your wife or your husband or your children. Then you stay in the mosque, you say, I'm worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. The, the, the religion, Islam, is always a religion of the middle. It's in the middle way. The middle way, no radical in the worship itself, no radical or extreme in not worshiping. Don't go away and don't also destroy your life because of what you think it's worship. The Prophet ﷺ, during his days, there were two, two brothers living there in Medina. One of them spent most of the time in the mosque praying, praying, reading Quran all the time. And another brother is outside working. 
when the Prophet ﷺ asked him, he said, what, who is this man? What is he doing? They said, well, he is a abid. He is spending all his time in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet said, who takes off his expenses then? Financially. Who is doing taking care of him financially? Who, who takes care of him? He needs food. He needs clothes. He needs many things. If he spend all the time here, then who takes care of him? And they said, his brother. He has a brother. The brother is the one who is working. And he spends money for this brother who is always in the mosque. Then the Prophet, what he said, he said, the other brother is worshipping Allah more than this one. Allah. See? Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees that. He sees that it's, it's your intention. The other brother wants to worship all the time, but he cannot because of the en engagement with the work, this commitment. But he has the intention. Same time, he is so kind and generous, he gives money to his family and to his brother. He didn't say to his brother, no, I'm not going to give you anything because you, you pray alone. And I'm, I cannot pray because I'm busy. No, he just, he generous. So Allah reward him also, maybe more than this one. Ramadan also, this is a very, very important point. Ramadan is the time that is you revise and you check your manners. Manners in Islam, dear brothers, is, are very, very important. Sometimes Allah reward you for manners more than he rewards you for prayer. Now you see some people, they always, mashallah, when the adhan comes or iqama, you will find them exactly behind the imam. Exactly. But try to have a problem with them, you will see how, 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 how extreme they are. They even do not hesitate to lie. Astaghfirullah al They don't hesitate to confiscate your rights. They do anything to just to win. It's about me, I have to win. They don't look at right and wrong. They don't look at, for example, justice, to be fair with people and just even against yourself. This is not everybody has it. But this is one of the signs of the real Iman in your heart. The Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith, إِنَّ الْمَرْأَ لَيَبْلُغُ بِحُسْنِ الْخُلُقِ دَرَجَةَ الصَّائِمِ لَا يُفْطِرْ وَالْقَائِمِ لَا يَفْطِرْ Some people, with, because of their good manners and behaviors, they reach the degree of the person who always fast and all the night pray. What did they do to reach this level? They didn't do anything. They had only good manners. They don't lie. They deal with people in a in very kindness, even if they are angry. They don't take anybody's right. They try to guide everyone. They don't cheat people. They don't lie to them. Manners, they are sometimes, if you have the intention. Now, if somebody says, Salaamu Alaikum, you are so busy. You don't want to say, but remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I reply, Alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a problem with somebody. Then he wants something from me. No, 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 because I have problem. No, I have nothing for you. Astaghfirullah al -Azim. Rights are rights. It doesn't ha it has nothing to do with your feelings. Manners are very, very important. We sometimes forget them. We think actually we can come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only by doing prayer and reading the Quran. But manners are very, very important. Also, in Ramadan, one of the manners we have to talk about, people used to come to the mosque in Ramadan more than other days. Because it's the time of Taraweeh. It's the time of Tahajjud. After that, people come together in the mosque. Don't forget the good manners in the mosque. Mosques also need good manners. It's not allowed to fight in the mosques. It's not allowed to shout or scream to people in the mosque. Also, Muslims are allowed to, to bring their children in the mosques. When you bring your children to the mosque, it's a good chance that is to lead, teach them discipline. When you come to this place, it is a place of quiet, a quiet place. Don't speak loud. Respect. You have to follow the Imam. You have to stand beside me. Don't run away from here disturbing other people. Don't make the place dirty. Don't throw anything from the Children will grow up with these manners. That is this place, the mosque is respected. Respect it. It's not like anywhere I go. It's not like my home. I can put this one anywhere. I can take it. I can throw it even in the dining room or somewhere. Then I take it the next day. No, the mosque is different. A Muslim must be clean actually everywhere he goes. Even in the street is not allowed to throw rubbish. But when the mosque it comes, the, the, the house of worship, it is even more. Patience is very important. Fasting, if you, of course, now Ramadan is still in summer, or almost in summer, okay? It's, it's in spring, actually, where the day is long. Now, if you hold yourself from, from food and from, from drinks all the day, I think 17 or 16 hours this year, well, this, this needs patience. 
this need be this is a good chance to control yourself to teach yourself self-control it is also a time to remember those people who do not find food or drink all the year not only Ramadan for them any other day is like Ramadan they don't have food some people in this world they don't find food all the day and all the night not only the during the night the, the night alhamdulillah here we fasted during the night and in the evening we have meals big meals sometimes at home but those people they do not have meals during the day and during the night don't it's not it's not the moment that is we remember them we remember what to do to our brothers and sisters who are away give them a charity remember them remember their suffering remember them in our dua in our prayers remember them by donations remember them really to help them it is a time to remember all my cousins and my families and the friends who may live somewhere in this world in another country and they are poor and I'm enjoying my life here with my family and those people are fasting Ramadan and they don't find food I saw some people Wallahi Azim, in Africa and other other parts of this world if you see their iftar after the long fasting Wallahi you will cry it is only water and sometimes a piece of bread this is if they find it and sometimes they continue fasting they, they, they do iftar in the intention because they don't find anything. When t time of iftar comes, they say, they, they have the intention that is the iftar, but they don't have any, any food. They wait two hours, three hours, five hours, or maybe even more to find even some of them, they continue to the next day without any kind of food. I have, we have to remember those brothers and sisters always. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who give everything. Don't be brothers and sisters, don't be afraid. That is, Allah will not give you or you, you, you will be poor, Allah will give you. Allah is generous. If you give, he will give you more. If you give, you give, try it yourself. Give more sadaqah, you will see what the reply is. The reply that is risk will come to you from another way. Sometimes it comes to you from unexpected way. Allah is almighty. He has his own plans and his own ways. Just try it yourself. Give sadaqah. Fi sabilillah. And you will see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for this. Teaching children to fast. This is very, very important. But don't be hard also with them. That is to They must fast all the day even if they cannot. Siyam is always a wajib. It's a duty for children when they are 15 years old. Mostly. 15, 14 years old. In general, I'm, I'm talking. But it is better to teach them how to fast even before at least fast some of the day and I remember when I was seven years old eight years old I will tell you about myself my father used to ask me to fast and it was hard of course to fast that was in Saudi Arabia hot in summer and then I start I try sometimes I hide away from my father I drink water he doesn't know <laughs> <laughs> there is a room in the house where there are a lot of dates I go there as if I'm going to take something then I eat something and then he knows, he knows after that I realized he knew, but he didn't say anything. Are you still fasting? I said, yeah, I'm fasting. <laughs> okay. Then for some time, then he said to me, son, fast till two o'clock midday or to, to, till 12. Then I start. 12 is your iftar. Maghrib is our iftar. So I was seven years old. And he just want, he want to teach me how to be patient. How to be seven years old or eight years old or nine years old or ten years old and you can control yourself from food and from drink. But not for a long time because don't harm their health. This is very important. Don't let them also hate Islam and hate worship. If you force them, you just be so hard with them, they will hate fasting. They will hate prayer also. They will hate going to the mosque. Make it something lovely to them. Say for example, till okay, you're fasting till 12, till 11, till 10 o'clock. After this, can you fast for two hours? No eating, no food. Let's try for a young one. Then he, he make it or she make it. Then okay, encourage him or encourage her. Then children, little by little, they will know how to control themselves, how to, mashallah, already for 25 minutes. <laughs> how they control themselves, how they become patient. This is something very, very important for their future, for their life. Finally, brothers, I have to remind you of the main thing of the whole thing that is all these teachers actually all these lessons all these things we have to try to to start a new life from Ramadan and at the end of Ramadan inshallah there is one small test just do it to know whether your Ramadan is accepted or not what is the test it's exactly the same like Hajj 
when you come to the Eid day, see, are you better than before? Then your Ramadan is successful. Are you the same? Then Ramadan didn't work as it should be or it should work. Are you worse? Then Astaghfirullah Azim, Allahu Alam, if Ramadan is accepted or not. It is exactly like Hajj. When you come back from Hajj, look at yourself and be honest with yourself. Just between your, you and your heart and yourself. Am I better than before? Then definitely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted my Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted my Ramadan. And if I'm not, if I'm the same, that means I haven't cleaned a lot from Ramadan. I have to revise again my heart. I have to try. Brothers, our hearts are always subject for a lot of destruction from the devil, from the shaitan, from ourselves themselves. Food is one of our necessity. We'd like to have it all the time. Drinks are our necessity. We like to have them. Sometimes also a shaitan takes us to other areas. Somebody is somewhere seeing a woman in the street, attracting your, your views or something. This is all the things try to control, try to control. The moment you are trying to control, Allah will reward you and give you encourage and give you more help. As long as you are trying, Allah forgive you. But if you don't care at all, then you are really lost. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described in the Quran, they have forgotten Allah and Allah let them forget themselves. Because when you forget Allah, it doesn't mean you forget Allah, you forget yourself. Because he is the only way that is to save you in the day of judgment. So don't never forget this. Final point, if Sheikh allows me to say, also ikhlas. Ikhlas. Ikhlas means sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With everything you do it, brothers, remember, I am doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for anybody. This is, this, this, is the, this is the indicator which shows you how the, 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 the work is accepted or not. When you give a charity, give it fi sabilillah, for Allah. Not, I'm giving a charity because my friends will see me, they'll say, MashaAllah, Ahmad is generous. No, no, keep this. If you do this, Allah doesn't accept it. When you do the fasting, I do it fi sabilillah, for Allah. When I do my prayer, it's fi sabilillah. That's why many of the, of the companions and the scholars and generations of Muslims, they used to hide themselves when they pray the nafila. When they pray in the night, they used to hide themselves. Sometimes they fast, nobody knows. Except if you invite them for food, they will say, I'm fasting. But if you don't invite them, nobody knows. They give charities, nobody knows about the charities. Sometimes the, the poor person, he receives the sadaqah and he doesn't know who gave it. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ said, that is your left hand doesn't know about your right hand when you give sadaqah. He wants to say, try to hide it. Why will you hide it? I hide it for two reasons. This poor person will not be, of course, embarrassed by, by my action. In front of people, I give him something. And also to be pure, fi sabilillah, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the first century of the, of the Islam, many people, poor people in Medina, they used to receive some sacks of food in the night. And they didn't know who used to bring this. Somebody knock in the darkness on their doors. When they open the door, they find a sack where there is food or bread or little bit money or something. Many families, about 100 house people say. Many years, and they try to catch this person who knock at the door in the darkness, then lift this and then run away. They didn't. Till after many years, Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, he passed away. When he passed away, nobody knocked in the, on, on, on their doors anymore. And the people knew that he was the man who come in the streets of Medina in the darkness all the night, giving the poor families some charities and put it near the door, knock at the door so that they open, they take it, and they, don't know who, they didn't know who, who used to give this. This is an example of these people, how they hide their work. They don't want people to see or they, their names, for example, written there or known or announced, they want Allah to know this. That's it. And this is the ikhlas. This is the sincerity for sabirullah. Any work you do it, try to do it, remember the niyyah. Remember the niyyah. Sometimes we do things just practically like sport. We do it. We don't remember the niyyah. No, try always to remember the niyyah. Without pronouncing it. Just the niyyah. I go to the mosque. I give this charity, I'm fasting today, alhamdulillah, I'm doing this, I go for hajj, I do this, I take care of my mother, I take care of my wife, I take care of my husband, I take care, then all this, a wife says that, this is actually fi sabilillah, because Allah ordered me to do it. And the Prophet said, even when you smile to somebody, fi sabilillah, this is a charity. 
If the man take food and put it in his wife's mouth, this is a charity. If you feed a, an animal, dog or cat or whatever, any animal, you give it water or food, when you know it, you, you, intend, you, 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 you intend this is a charity, it's a charity. Allah reward you for it. Don't underestimate any, any good work or good action you do it. Sometimes we underestimate small things, but Allah sees them bigger, very big and huge. Yeah. And we don't forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive a woman who was a prostitute because she gave food, she gave water to a dog, lost dog in the desert. Allah reward her, thank her for this, then he forgave all the sins before. Just because of a dog, water for a dog, which doesn't cost that much. You see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is grateful and thankful? Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Sorry, I talk too much. No, no, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, I'd like to extend my gratitude to uh, Honorable Dr. Ahmed Dubayan, the Director General of the London Central Mosque and Islamic Culture Centre in Regent's Park. Jazakumullah uh, for the very informative lecture on the virtues of Haraween and also on the virtues of Ramadan al Mubarak. I'm sure we've learned a lot today, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. the young brothers. Um, again, thank you very much, brothers and sisters, for joining us here in this auspicious gathering organized by Al Falak Dawa Project in affiliation with Shah Jalal Mosque and Hajj Nasiha. We have this event every month in different locations with different qualified scholars. Please do join us whenever you get a chance. Um, and uh, also, the refreshments will be provided uh, out there in the next room. Please uh, enjoy the refreshments, do the for us. And also, if you can support us um, with your uh, physically and financially, that would be also appreciated. Um, and uh, lastly, just uh, to remind the apologies from Sheikh Abu Bakr Shatari once again, he sent his sincere apologies he couldn't make. Uh, please uh, accept his apologies. Jazakumullah khairan for being with us. Shukran. And once again, uh, I would like to uh, uh, for the Dr. Uh, Ahmed Dubayan. Allah, Barakallah, Fimala, granting all the goodness in this world and in the next world for his immense contribution towards the battle of the British communities or the Muslim communities in Britain. Uh, this program will be concluded with a short dua by Sheikh Qadir Islam, the Masjid Imam and Khatib of this Masjid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Just uh, I would like to say to Shaykh Ahlan wa Sahlan Mahaba for here, Alhamdulillah. Uh, just I would like to inform him this mosque is one of the oldest mosques in London. Yes. Unfortunately, unfortunately, from long time, this mosque is like this condition. It's older than but than Alhamdulillah, <laughs> very soon you can see a beautiful mosque, inshallah, like a London Central Mosque. But exactly. your dua, your support. <laughs> Needed, <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> Keep remembering <laughs> <in> this <laughs> month, inshallah. <laughs> and hopefully, you will come here again, inshallah, for the Libertad long speech, inshallah. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma ameen. Rabbana adhulamna anfusana wa illam taqfillana wa tarhamna lana kuna lana al-fasila. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sa'iyya wa al-alim. Wa alayna ya maulana inna ka anta tawab wa rahim. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyyatina qurwata a'yun. وجعلنا للمتقين إيمانا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت توابنا آمين يا رب العالمين جزاكم الله خيرا